Today is the 25th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Our Gospel is Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. It's a parable that's almost calculated to get under the skin of us moderns. We know it well. The owner of the vineyard goes into the marketplace and hires laborers at the beginning of the day, makes an agreement with them as to how much their day's work will be paid. He goes back several times during the day and he hires more laborers. We're not told of any agreement in this instance, however. And especially we're not told of his agreement, if there was one, with those who came in at the last minute. Yet at the point of settlement, when the vineyard owner is paying the laborers for their labor, he starts with those who came in at the last minute and gives them the amount that he'd agreed to give to those who worked the full day. Now, so far, so good. What this, I think, quite reasonably sets up as an expectation in those who bore the heat of the day and worked for many hours, that surely they're going to get more than those who came last. And not so. According to this story, the vineyard owner says, didn't I agree? Didn't you agree? Well, stop grumbling. The kingdom of heaven is like this. Like what? In grappling with a parable such as this, in fact, it applies to all the parables, we must resist the temptation to reduce them to allegories or moral fables which tend to yield easy lessons. Do this, don't do that. Rather, let the parable take hold of your imagination. Let it have its way with you. It will yield what it will yield. Let his word be done. Now, right at the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, we are told that John the Baptist proclaimed a message of repentance. The kingdom of heaven is here, repent. Matthew, soon after telling us what John proclaimed, tells us that Jesus proclaims the same message. Now, I think the word repent, repentance, they've taken on a not entirely helpful meaning for us. The Greek verb metanoeo refers to an, a reorientation of one's whole being, change of direction, and most especially a change of thinking. The, the repentant person is in the process of thinking differently about herself or himself, the world, other people, whatever. It's that new way of thinking that I'd like to focus on. Now, in Isaiah chapter 55, the prophet is told, My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. They are as high above your thoughts and ways as the heaven is above the earth. The incarnation, the enfleshing of this mysterious community we call God demands a different way of thinking about society, about politics, about history, about what it means to be a human being. We have to learn that way of thinking. And the gospel is full of rebuttals to alternative ways of thinking other than the way that God thinks, the first are last, the last are first, the weak are strong, the strong are weak, blessed are the poor in spirit, and so on. All of these are little challenges to our accepted way of thinking, learning to think as God thinks, learning to think as Jesus thinks is really a huge practical challenge for us and a great opportunity. How wonderful it would be 
to be part of a community where people thought like Jesus, had minds and hearts that saw the world and thought about the world and experienced the world as God does. St. Paul, I think, grasps this well when he writes to the Corinthians that really, I think, at the heart of this message, for we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. We live in a culture where the presumed, the default way of thinking is, I think, rightly called rationalism. It's the kind of thinking that's appropriate to the laboratory or the pursuit of science. But it's only one way of thinking. And there are times when it's not the best way of thinking. Yes, the rational can yield the truth. The rational, presumed to be the only way of thinking, becomes rationalism. And it misses out on so much. The poet and the mystic do not think that way. Because they think in an alternative kind of a way, they will come to horizons of meaning and truth and beauty and goodness that rationalism can never get to. This, just because it's poetic or mystic, doesn't mean it's the way God thinks. However, it's an example of the human capacity to think and to expand one's horizons. Again, back to St. Paul, writing to the Philippians. Put on the mind of Christ. Christ. 